love talking about this subject, which is dynamic life, creation and the changes in living things. I like having a whole session to talk about it because I, I don't like it much when people sort of just look at what a speaker says and, he, and they say, well, yeah, he sounds good. I think I'll accept what he says. It makes sense. I, I prefer it when people reach a point that I call the aha point. When you say, aha, now I get it. Now I really get it. And I think this area of biology is one where, where many of you can reach that aha point. I certainly hope you do. Some of you may already have, because I believe this is a very, very powerful area of creation apologetics, one that can be used by many, many people. And it revolves around a very simple, but at the same time, very powerful concept. And that's a concept that's easy to understand in our computer age, and that's the concept of information. You see, inside each one of us, in fact, inside every living thing, there is a whole mess of information, you know, not just a few kilobytes and megabytes and gigabytes and so on, of information which is on a long rope-like molecule that most people have heard of called DNA. Now, how can a long molecule store information? It's a little bit like this. You imagine if you had a piece of rope that was long enough and you knew the Morse code and you tied one knot for a dot and two knots for a dash, you have a long enough piece of rope, you can write the whole encyclopedia, Britannica or the Bible or whatever. And uh, it's a little bit like it is with DNA. There's not just one long piece of rope inside of you that specifies, like a recipe if you like, a set of instructions to make up not just what species you'll be, in other words, that you'll be a human being rather than an alligator or an avocado tree, but what sort of human being within limits? Will you be very short, very tall, brown eyes, blue eyes, that, those sorts of things. That information in human beings is carried not just on one long rope-like molecule, but on two ropes running parallel side by side. In fact, these two long ropes inside of our cells are cut up into 23 chunks called chromosomes, pairs of chromosomes. So if you like, the two long ropes are like a book, the chromosomes are like the chapters in the book, and what are genes, G-E-N-E-S? They're just little stretches of information which are really like chunks of the DNA, which is like sentences. So you might have a gene that spells out, you know, this person will have blue eyes or this person will have brown eyes. Now, I'm, I'm going to be simplifying a bit, but I think you'll find, even if you're highly trained in biology, that the points will be valid if you allow me a little bit of simplification. In fact, inside one of our cells, there is enough information, the equivalent of which would fill a library of about 1,000 books of information. So the beginning point that I want to make is that information specifies living things. And I've drawn the information for an amoeba. I've symbolized that by one book. It's actually more than that. An amoeba is like a little one-celled thing that lives in a pond. And people call it a simple cell, but it's actually horrendously complex. But let's just call it a simple cell. One thing we do know is that the information in the amoeba is far less than the information to make up a horse, for example. So if a protozoan like that has evolved into not just ponies, but you know pelicans, pomegranates, and people, and so on, then obviously you have to have a process that adds more information over those millions of years because you see the amoeba doesn't have the information how to spell out things like eyes, ears, blood, brains, hooves and so on. What's the significance of all of this? You see, I was walking behind um, a crowd of people walking into a lecture that I was about to give in South Australia many years ago and the people in front of me didn't know that I was behind them, the speaker was behind them and one of them was one of these, you know, salt of the earth farmer types. And he was saying, ah, you know, these here creationists, they're not going to convince me there's no evolution. I mean, in my grandfather's day, we never had Jersey cows and now we've got Jersey cows. And if that's not evolution, I don't know what is. Well, of course, we've had new breeds of cows and new breeds of dogs and mosquitoes have become resistant to DDT in only 40 years following World War II. And you know, there's many creationists that see that as, well, big deal. I've got an answer to that. And when they're challenged on that sort of evolution happening all around us, like the mosquitoes evolving the resistance to DDT, their answer is this. Well, the cows are still cows. The mosquitoes are still mosquitoes. They haven't turned into elephants or anything like this. Ha, ha, ha. Well, you know what? That's all true. It's true that 
they're still the same basic type of creature and they haven't turned into another basic type and this is variation within a kind but let me say this to you if that's the answer you give it's not a very good answer why do I say that well you know when I was an evolutionist this is how I would have taken it if I'd said to somebody you know challenging the Christian you know mosquitoes have evolved resistance to DDT in only 40 years isn't it obvious that evolution is a fact it's happening all around us and they'd said well look it's still a mosquito isn't it you know next subject as it were you know what I would have thought to myself it's no point arguing with this person they don't really understand evolution because you see I would have said evolution is supposed to take millions of years and if there's been that much change in the mosquito in only 40 years Imagine what would happen if you stretched that into millions of years and you really would start talking about bigger and bigger changes. And so really what the issue is, is not the fact that there's change happening and that change is not big enough change, the issue is what type of change? Is it the sort of change that if you gave it enough time could turn a mosquito into an elephant or something like this? Well the only way it could do that would be to add lots and lots of new information. So my main point is that evolution is a process that if it's happening it should be capable in theory of adding lots of not just new sentences but new chapters and paragraphs and whole volumes to the book of life. And so if somebody says to you over there in that population of living things there's some real evolution happening, have a look at what's happening and ask the important question, is information being added? Because if the information is being lost then of course no one can turn around and say that that change is the sort of change which if you multiply it by millions of years is going to go in the direction of particles to people and so on. In fact the staggering thing is that to this point in time every single one of the examples of evolution happening that anyone has ever used in a creation evolution context that we know of is not just not adding information it's actually losing information in other words it's going in the wrong direction now don't get me wrong that doesn't mean that that, that proves that evolution didn't happen but what it means is that it is illegitimate totally illegitimate to use that as an evidence that evolution is happening all around us if by evolution which is what most people mean by it you mean the sort of change that is capable in principle of turning a frog into a prince and so on you know friends to give you an example of this and I've discussed this with uh, many evolutionists and I've had debates over the years a handful of them with uh, biological academics and so on including f formal debates and uh, the sorts of things that they often think before they've really thought the issue through is that any sort of change is the same as proof of evolution. They don't differentiate. It's a bit like saying, in fact one of them wrote this, uh, uh, not, not a guy I debated but a man called Dr. Jerry Coyne, he said look it's obvious if you see grandma's train leaving the station and you see that train heading from you know two cities in the USA it wouldn't mean much to most people here but let's say from Sydney to Melbourne uh, and you saw the train leaving the station and heading part of the way to Melbourne well you can be reasonably confident that it's capable, it's got what it takes to go the rest of the way. My point is that in fact we're seeing the train go in the opposite direction so that if you gave it millions of years you would not end up with evolution, you would end up with extinction. And the example I'll use to try and uh, demonstrate this is something very simple uh, involving ordinary house cats and again it's a simplification but first of all let me explain something about those two long ropes of information why do we have two ropes well the answer is one rope we inherit from our mother the other one from our father so if you like each gene has a backup copy isn't it marvelous how you can use computer jargon these days to explain these things so if uh, by the way how do we pass on that information you men you make, you're making copies of your information all the time and passing it on in your sperm cells. You ladies, you've made copies of your information and you've got lots of it packed into your egg cells already. That's how the information gets to the next generation. By the way, you don't make a copy of all of your information. You only copy half of your information, but it's a different half each time and it's sort of recombined and reshuffled which means this is a mechanism by which we get the tremendous variety
among human beings and animals and plants and so on, because otherwise all brothers and sisters and everybody would, would look alike if they were offspring from the same two parents. How is that information copied? Is it copied like a, a photocopier? You know, you put a page on and it sort of copies all the information pretty well at once. It's not like that. It's actually copied more like an automatic typewriter, you know, or a word processor copying one letter at a time. And so in reproduction in humans, millions of letters are copied in just a few minutes. And that's why sometimes there's a typo, a copying mistake. Now that copying mistake is what we call mutations, a word most of us have heard of. That's all it is, a glitch in the information of heredity that's passed on. And we get lots of inherited diseases that are passed on generation to generation from these inherited glitches. Why are they inherited? Why do they keep on getting passed down? Well, that's because when you make a copy of a defective copy, you pass on the defect, don't you? If you've got a defective floppy disk and you, you know, get someone to make a copy or, or a defective Word document and so on, you'll pass that glitch on until in the process of copying, there's another glitch. And so that glitch is added to the original glitch, which is why after many generations, there are these hundreds of accumulated mistakes. Did you know that? Did you know that we're all carrying hundreds of these accumulated defects inherited from generations past? Actually looking around the room, that's not all that surprising, but <laughs> at least I can blame mine on my plastic surgeon. But the, the reality is we don't actually, the good news is we don't actually show our mistakes. Why is that? Because we inherit two copies, remember one and a backup copy and so on. And so if you've got the glitch on only one copy, then the other copy still has the right information there and that sort of compensates for it. So it's only when you get the glitch from both parents that you have a problem. We'll go into that more afterwards because that becomes significant to answering one of the common Bible challenges. So let's just accept that genes come in pairs and let's look at the situation of ordinary pussycats. When I went to Canada, a very cold place, the first time I noticed that all of the cats, they look pretty much the same as the pussycats in Brisbane houses, except Canada is a very cold place and these cats all had thick fleecy fur. Now, do I think that the difference is that God created the cats in Canada with thick fleecy fur and he created the cats in Brisbane differently? No, I don't. I believe that they got their differences most likely from adaptation to the cold through natural selection. And many people would say, oh, haven't you just given away the store? No, I haven't. And, and you'll see why. And natural selection on its own is not the same as evolution. We needn't be afraid of it. In fact, it was a Christian and a creationist called Edward Blythe who first thought of it, who first wrote about it, and he saw it completely within a creation biblical framework. And in fact, many people think Darwin might have uh, copied some of the, those ideas from Blythe. So let's use this, this hypothetical way of explaining it. Here you have um, these two cats, a male cat and a female cat, mum and dad. And let's say that there are three genes, three different places on the chromosome that determine the length of fur, which means that you've got six, three pairs equals six. Remember, each position is one pair, one from mum and one from dad. And let's imagine that there are only two forms of that gene that determine the length of hair. And I've drawn the ones that are squiggly. They represent genes that spell out, make lots of fur. The ones that are thin like this, they spell out, make hardly any fur. So because each of these cats has three skinny ones and three fluffy ones, then that sort of averages out and they have medium length fur. Now if two cats like that, I call these the Brisbane cats, you know, where it's nice mild climate most of the year, that sort of thing. If they get married, or however you put that, then, <laughs> then uh, in their offspring, there are still six positions that must be filled. Now, it's a bit like a roll of the dice. There's no conscious choosing going on, but the offspring can end up with any three from dad and any three from mum. And so you don't need a degree in mathematics to work out that in the offspring, most of them will end up being like mum and dad. They'll end up having medium fur like that. Now, occasionally, some of them will have one more of the furry genes. And so they'll end up with somewhat thick fur. But you notice that when they get an extra thick fur gene, 
they actually displace, if you like, the possibility of getting as many skinny genes and so therefore they end up with one less of those thin fur genes and so on you could go. So you imagine you have hundreds of kittens with all of that variety in them and you dump them off the back of a truck in a freezing cold Ontario winter. Emil Silvestri would rather be there than in a sweaty Sydney summer, but anyway. You, you will find that at the end of that winter, the ones that are most likely to have survived are the ones that have got more of these furry genes. The next generation, you'll have kittens or cats running around looking more like that. And so the chances of the next generation after that inheriting furry genes is much, much higher. And so it only takes a few winters because you're getting rid of the cats that can't survive that well because they die from the cold. By the way, that's natural selection, isn't it? Survival of the fittest. It, it, it's a fact of life because the fittest are the ones that survive by definition. Like saying the sky is blue, blue is the sky. There's, there's no big deal in it. It's a, just an, an ordinary fact. But after a few generations, you're very likely to end up with a bunch of cats left over that all look like that. Now, what we've seen is natural selection, survival of the fittest. We've seen adaptation to the environment, haven't we? All these evolutionary words, they've adapted by natural selection. It's a new type of cat, but have we seen any new information added? Let me just stress again the importance of this information thing. You see, in the evolutionary story, once upon a time, there was a world in which there were living things, but there were no lungs. Lungs had not evolved yet, which means there was no information coding for lungs anywhere in the universe, in the, in the biosphere. It had to be written by this evolutionary process. Then later on, there was a time in which there were lungs, but there were no wings yet, no feathers, they hadn't evolved yet. And so the whole evolutionary process, no matter how much information goes up and down, in a net sense, it demands a massive addition of this information. Therefore, it, it, it requires, by definition, a process which is in principle capable of doing that. And so if someone shows you a process like this and uses that as an example of evolution, can you see why it's not only irrelevant, it's the opposite of what's required from evolution? Because what's actually happened? Sure, we've seen adaptation, we've seen natural selection, but have we seen any new information created? No. Even more importantly, we have seen information lost. You see, those cats are now specialised for their environment, but they've become specialised through a loss of some of the information, which means, by the way, that they can't evolve any further back in the other direction. Because, you see, if you take all of those furry cats and you drop them off in Sydney at a summer super camp in the early stages, they'll all die of heat stroke. Isn't that right? Well, you see the point. You've, you've actually thinned out the information. You, you've made it less flexible. And can you see how important it is if God is creating creatures to survive, multiply, fill the earth, to slow down, if you like, the rate of extinction in a decaying, fallen world, it's very important that he gives them a variety of information to begin with so that they can adapt by natural selection in both directions. Some of them will be able to adapt to hot climates, some to cold climates. But the more that adaptation happens, the more specialized things become, the less change you can get from then on. That's why these thick-furred cats can't easily become thin-furred cats and so on. By the way, Darwin was right about something, I believe, very right, when he saw breeding selection, artificial selection, as a good analogy for natural selection. In other words, man can select and choose. For instance, if you were a bunch of mongrel dog, I'm sorry about that, but, and I wanted to breed from this population of mongrel dogs with all the variety there, some short, some tall, and some cute, some not so cute. I'm not looking at anyone. And, and you wanted to have a small, cute dog to sit on your lap, a different breed of dog, what would you do? You would choose from this population the smallest and cutest and let them get together and so on. Then from their offspring, you'd choose the smallest and cutest. What are you doing? You're doing exactly what natural selection is doing. You're not killing off the rest, you know, the leftover ones, but you're ignoring them. You're separating them from the rest and you're choosing only that line that you're interested in that is fit to survive 
to your taste, as it, as it were. So it's a good analogy. You see, that's the process by which people have been able to breed out from a mongrel dog population things that are tremendously diverse. You know, groups of dogs like Great Danes and Chihuahuas and colleagues and those sorts of things. But here's the key point, that there was more variability in the genes of that mongrel population than in any of these daughter populations. To put it very simply, in order to get from that sort of average dog with a lot of variety to a dog where they're all small and cute, like a little chihuahua, you know, something like a white rat on a string, as some people say, <laughs> then you would, you would have to lose some of the genes for great daneness, for bigness, if you like. By the way, notice that there's a limit. You can breed dogs that are incredibly small, but you'll never get a dog that's fully grown as the size of a cockroach, you know? The genes aren't there for that sort of thing. Same in the other direction. You can breed a massive Great Dane and so on, but you can't breed a dog the size of an of a Asian elephant or something like this. There's not the information there. So here's the point. Breeding selection and natural selection very quickly reach limits because gene pools run out of information. Now notice that there's no reason whatsoever why this diversification, this splitting up of a large amount of variety into less and less variety, why that can't even lead to new species. Why do I say that? Species is a man-made definition and the most common definition is two groups which will not freely and naturally interbreed. So what if you did the experiment, and I've never done it, but uh, I can imagine if you released a population of Great Danes and another population of Chihuahuas onto an island somewhere, they might have some trouble freely and naturally interbreeding. And therefore, by definition, they might be called new species. But so what? What's the big deal? Because you see, you've got no new information added. So there's nothing to be terrified about, about the idea of speciation. So what would an informed evolutionist say? in a debate situation or something in response to this, would say, of course, of course, yeah, really, really, we know that natural selection by itself doesn't add information, but they would say, we have a way of getting that new information, and really there is only one game in town, and that is mutation, copying mistakes. In other words, evolutionary theory demands ultimately that all of that new information to turn microbes into magnolias and microbiologists and so on has developed by this random accidental process which is then filtered by, by this natural selection. Is it capable of doing that? Are mutations capable of that? By the way, don't get bluffed when evolutionists say, well, no, that's not true. There's other means. There's hybridization. That's, that's when two groups of information mix together. Well, that doesn't create any new information. And then there's a thing called polyploidy. In some plants, some of them might have, for example, 24 chromosomes. And then, due to an accidental genetic mistake, they double the number of chromosomes. Instead of 24, you've got 48. And because they can't breed with each other, then it's a new species. And so people say, wow, look at all the extra information. But it's not. It's just a photocopy of the same information. It hasn't generated anything new in the whole biosphere. You know, imagine if you were a student asked to do an an essay, and a 5,000 word essay, and you, you, you know, you're handed in two copies of a 2,500 word essay. And you said, well, what are you complaining about? It's the, exactly the same number of amount of information as you asked for. You wouldn't get marks for that, would you? Well, here's the interesting thing. We know of thousands of mutations. By the way, many of them are known because of the diseases they cause. Thousands of inherited diseases, beta thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, alcaptinuria, and so on. And uh, yet in all of those thousands of mutations that we know of, so far we do not know of one that's added a little bit of information. There's a tremendous book written by a biophysicist. He's an Israeli scientist. His name is Dr. Lee Spetner. And he's actually been a, a research fellow at Johns Hopkins University in the United States. And his specialty was signal noise relationships in DNA. In other words, information issues in DNA. And he's published in some of the leading molecular journals and so on. And he said this, he, in his book, Not By Chance, which we stock and recommend, he said, any all-point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not increase it. You know, Spetner makes it clear that it wouldn't bother him or surprise him if now and again there was, in a complex world, a mutation that added a little bit of information. Well, I agree with him on that. You know, because uh, 
there's just mutations happening all the time. Maybe, they, But you see, evolutionary theory, when you do the mathematics, as Spetner does in his book, demands that out of all the thousands of mutations happening, that there should be hundreds of these positive uphill mutations, information adding ones, and he defines very carefully what he means, so don't be bluffed by evolutionists who say, oh, well, there's no way of knowing what that means and so on. Um, he says that even though we wouldn't be surprised if there were one or two, it wouldn't be enough, but the irony is that so far there's not one. Let me give you an example of some mutations. There's one here in a rooster. Um, we call it the TNR mutation, totally naked rooster. Now, now, that's an obvious example of information loss or else corruption of information. That rooster has the inability to express the information for generating feathers. Now, obviously, that's not really good for the chicken. It might be good for Colonel Sanders, but not much for the chicken. But it, that's an obvious loss, but sometimes losses are not obvious, and they're still losses. Here's an example of the feather duster mutation in a creature which is actually a budgerigar. So that poor budgie there, the feathers just keep on growing and growing. That's not information increase. What's actually happened is that a, mu that a mutation has happened, a corruption of the information to throw the switch to stop the feathers from growing because life is incredibly, unimaginably complex. It needs all these delicate control mechanisms, not just to switch things on, but to switch things off. So when you have something switched off normally, and that switch is corrupted, that's a loss of information, even if it increases the production of something. To summarize, Lee Spetner said, not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. So in short, what we see in living things is consistent with what we would expect from the Bible, which is that in the beginning, groups, different populations were created of creatures, which each of them had a lot of information essential to allow them to survive, adapt, to multiply and fill the earth on a number of occasions, particularly after the flood. You see, I don't believe that Noah had to take a dingo, a wolf, a coyote, and a Great Dane on the ark. I believe he took two of what we would perhaps call a canine kind or a dog kind. By the way, you know how often in the older creationist books they make what's, I think, an embarrassing glitch? They say, well, a mule. A mule is a great proof that the horse and the donkey or the ass have been separately created because a mule is sterile and so on. But you see, the whole point is that they can hybridize. And you know, I said to you before that having new species, in other words, watching new species form today, would not be a big deal. In fact, it's more than that. It actually is exciting for the creationist. And we've published several times in the magazine how species have been observed to form today using that biological definition very, very quickly. And the more quickly it happens, the more astonished evolutionists are. You hear things written like, oh, we thought it would take millions of years, like in yellow-footed rock wallabies and so on. But in actual fact, it looks like the genes are programmed to jump around and to form new species. And this is happening in about you know, five years, what we thought would take millions of years. Can you see why that excites the creationist? Because it allows us to understand Bible history, to understand how in a short period, in a few hundred years, you have plenty of time to get the diversification into all of the different, you know, dog subgroups, you know, the, the, the jackal and the uh, fox and the wolf and all those sorts of things. And, you know, one of the things that uh, people are taught as evidence of evolution among living things, this hasn't got to do with changes in living things, but it's another evidence that's often used, is the evidence from similarity, you know? The same sort of pattern is used in the forelimbs of these very, very different creatures. It's called the pentadactyl limb pattern. And you know, if you look closely, you can see the incredible similarities. But you know, let's, let's say this up front. That is consistent with, and therefore it is evidence for, the idea that these came from a common designer. But if you leave it at that, and you don't teach children how to think, what they think they've seen is proof of a common designer, when in fact it is also evidence for, because it is consistent with, a, did I say common designer? I meant common ancestor, coming from the same ancestor that had that pattern. But it's also evidence for a common designer, the same designer using the same basic pattern. Well, why is that? People say, well, why would God make that same pattern? Well, maybe because it makes good engineering sense. 
because when you think about it, that same pattern is also found in our hind limb. And if we take that argument of the evolutionist that that means a common ancestor, then that would argue that we all came from an ancestor that only had four limbs or only had hind limbs, which of course is ridiculous and nobody believes that. You know, to simplify the argument further, many of you will know that uh, the earlier Porsches had air-cooled, horizontally opposed rear engines, and that the Volkswagen Beetle used to have an air-cooled, horizontally opposed rear engine. So the tremendously similar vehicles. What was the reason for the similarity? The reason was that they had the same designer. Can anyone tell me who it was? Actually, you pronounce it Porsche. Ferdinand Porsche, but everybody says Porsche, so, so, so that'll do. But the same man designed it, so he used the same basic principles. But you know, sometimes there are examples where the common design argument, the fact that it's the same designer, makes much more sense than evolution. In fact, there are evidences that show that it's pretty well impossible to explain by evolution. For example, the development of the human and the frog hand, and those of you who saw the debate I had recently would have seen this, um, the way in which the human hand develops, and of course, according to evolutionary thinking, the similarities between the human hand and the frog hand with their five digits is because we definitely came from the same ancestor that had that sort of digit pattern. But if we had the same ancestor, if that's the reason for the similarity, then you would have common ancestral genes and the same sort of development pathway. And that's just common sense. But the way they develop is radically different. And the frog hand, the material, sorry, the human hand, the material between the digits dissolve. In the frog hand, the digits grow from buds. It's almost as if God is saying, hey, most of the time you can, you know, uh, it, it's a bit subtle and it's your choice whether you choose to reject my word and believe in a common ancestor. But here, when you really think about it, common sense tells you that the common ancestry, the evolutionary explanation doesn't work. And you know, when there are many instances too in which evolutionists see creatures that are incredibly similar, incredibly similar, so similar that one would say they must have come from a common ancestor in evolutionary theory. But hey, other aspects of the theory means that couldn't have happened. And therefore, they have a, a secondary explanation, which they call convergent evolution, parallel evolution, those sorts of things. So here you have creatures that, as far as their appearance is concerned, are incredibly similar. But the ichthyosaur, being a reptile, could not have had a common ancestor in evolutionary theory with the shark. Neither could the killer whale, which is a mammal. And so therefore, they say, well, just by sheer confluence of environment and random mutations and so on, they happen to end up with the same engineering design. That's not impossible in their theory, of course, but the thing is that similarity due to a common designer is far more convincing and less ad hoc and more believable. You know, the thing becomes particularly, this evolutionary explanation of parallel evolution and so on becomes particularly hard to swallow when it, you see the differences and the similarities between the marsupials found today largely in Australia, but not exclusively, and the placental mammals. In fact, there's almost like there's a carbon copy with a few variations of every type of creature you can think of. Here's the, the mammalian wolf, the placental wolf. Here you have the marsupial wolf, the now extinct Tasmanian tiger, as it's called. The ocelot and the native cat, the flying squirrel and the flying Falanger, and the, and the list goes on. You know, when I was in uh, South Africa recently, I was speaking at the University of Cape Town, about 170 students, quite a number of them had stayed behind, even though they were not part of the Christian group that organized the lecture, because they had actually just had the introductory talk on evolutionary biology in the first year. And incidentally, sadly, the lecturer that was, you know, strongly pushing evolution was a representative of a major evangelical Christian campus ministry. That really made me sad. But anyway, the, uh, I talked about these embryos and I could see their eyes getting wider and wider because actually they just had this evidence given to them as evidence for evolution. It is drawings by the German zoologist Ernst Haeckel from the uh, 1800s. He was a fanatical Darwinist. He was Darwin's disciple on the continent. He had a tremendous amount to do with the rapid acceptance of evolution in Germany.
which had a lot to do. You can trace it very clearly. It's been done by scholars through the philosopher Nietzsche and his, his philosophy of the Superman, the strongest race and those sort of things. And that was, of course, taken on by Hitler. And uh, the rest is pretty tragic history. But these were the drawings that he used to indoctrinate people into evolutionary thinking. He said they were taken from life. He looked at these things under the microscope and this is what he saw. This is the embryos of these very different creatures, fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, rabbit, human, at the same stage of embryonic development. And here's the take home message that our young people are supposed to get. The take home message is, hey, we're nothing really special. Look at the similarities. Isn't it obvious that we all evolved from a common designer? And at that stage, there's nothing much different you know, between us and so on. You know, here's the first thing to realize, that even if that was the way it was, that wouldn't be a big deal, would it? Because you see, if I have a series of buildings and I've got the blueprint for each one, and I know from the blueprint that this one is going to be a, uh, before it's built, an outside toilet, this one is gonna be a skyscraper, this one a palace, and, and this one a domestic dwelling. They're radically different buildings, and all of that is already in the blueprint, just like the DNA blueprint of these things, these creatures. But at the stage of pouring the foundations, they look pretty similar, don't they? And yet, that similarity is because you've got a similar, intelligent engineering design principle used to build them. And the longer the development goes on, the less similar they become. That's easy to see that as a common designer explanation. But the tragic thing is that that is not how they look. Just a very few years ago, as we showed in Creation magazine, an evolutionary embryologist decided for the first time in well over a century that anybody decided to actually, actually go and photograph these creatures and see what they looked like, these uh, embryos. And that's the actual photos. Couldn't be more different, could they? You know, it is not too strong to refer to this as outright fraud. You know, as a related subject is the question of can you marry your relative? You know, you ask that in a number of churches and uh, this is a sort of reaction, you know, shock, horror. Well, of course you can't. I mean, that's, that's hopeless. But you know, the, sad, the interesting thing is that if you're not marrying a relative, you've got a problem because that means you're not marrying a human being because the Bible makes it clear that we're all related. We all go back to Adam and Eve and even closer to that, to Noah and his three sons and their wives. And of course, many people say, well, how could you get all the different groups of people? You know, what's the origin of the so-called races from one family? I mean, did Noah have a black son, a brown son, a green son? What, what, what was the explanation there? Well, it's really not like that. You see, many people still have the idea that there's lots of different skin colors. But we know today that there's really only one skin color. It's a browny black pigment called melanin. And what shade of brown you are depends upon how much information, what the information tells you about how much melanin it's going to pump out into your skin. You see, they have information for a lot of melanin being pumped out into your skin. You're going to look dark brown. No such thing as, as black skin. If you have the information for a little bit, will you have white skin? No. I like to say, that's white. I'm not white. You see the difference? Forget the silver watch band. But I'm light brown. Actually, I'm a little bit pinkish. Why is that? Because I don't have enough of that sunscreen melanin to prevent the reddish color of my blood cells from showing through. That's all it is. In other words, what am I saying? We've all got the same chemical there. There's no differently evolved chemical. You know, it's the same pigment, melanin, gives you the color of your eyes. If the information for a lot of it pumped out into the iris of your eye, you have brown eyes. If you have the information for a little bit, you have, now here you might say, I've got you now, there must be this separately evolved blue chemical. No, there's not. It's the same pigment melanin that gives you the blue eyes. When you've got a little bit of it, it gives an optical illusion from the scattering of the light. Just like, you know, the sky is blue, but there's no, no blue paint in the sky. Same with your hair. You have the information for a lot of melanin in your hair. You have brown hair or black hair. Information for a little bit, you have blonde hair. Am I saying that blue-eyed blondes have less information? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that we can deduce that Adam and Eve could not have been, as they're often drawn, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, pale-skinned, because then they wouldn't have had enough information to generate all the different people groups. You see, two 
brown-eyed people with the right mix of genes can have blue-eyed and brown-eyed offspring, but two blue-eyed people can't have a brown-eyed offspring, it's just not the information there. So Adam and Eve were almost certainly middle brown skin, brown hair, brown eyes, which means what? It means that they're the same as most of the world's population. Should that really surprise us? You see, a lot of racist ideas were tremendously, according to Stephen Jay Gould, who's an evolutionist, were tremendously exaggerated, heightened, they increased by orders of magnitude, said Gould, after Darwin published his book. Why is that? Because it's a logical consequence of evolutionary thinking that we all evolved our so-called differences from you know, thousands, tens of thousands of years of separation, which means we must be all very different, different stages of evolution, some more evolved, some less evolved. And so that gave an excuse for the sin of racism. In fact, at one point, uh, Darwin and his colleagues, they wrote things in The Descent of Man and so on they, that really downplayed the Australian Aboriginal people, called them living missing links and all that sort of thing. And so literally thousands of Aboriginals, I know there's been some exaggeration in, in Australian history and so on about these things, but it's been well documented that literally thousands of Aboriginal remains are in museums overseas as evolutionary specimens of missing links and that some of them were deliberately murdered. In fact, the mayor of Bowen in far north Queensland in his memoirs admitted that he shot and killed an Aboriginal for no other purpose than to lop, down, lop off his head and boil it down and send the skull to London for an evolutionary specimen. In fact, our Australian National Museum, to our disgrace, classified our Aboriginal people under the heading Australian animals and even gave you instructions how to plug up the bullet holes after you'd shot your specimen for science. What should the church have done then? It should have said, hang on, instead of compromising and being intimidated, this book, the Bible, this is the very word of God and it gives us the true history of man and according to that, we are all astonishingly closely related and so if science doesn't agree, that means science hasn't caught up to all the facts yet. And if the church had done that, it would have anticipated modern molecular biology, which ins insists that we are all astonishingly closely related, that the word race in humanity really has no biological meaning. And it's easy, as the Answers book shows, how with the right genetic variation, you can get the whole range of 64 or so shades of skin color in only one generation. And the same is true for things like, you know, eye shape and things like that. For instance, you have your uh, so-called Asiatic or Chinese eye has to do with, uh, you know, additional folds of skin, additional fat layers, but not so much additional, but extra information for, for extra things like more fat or less fat. We've all got the same stuff. And without going into all of the figures, the DNA variation in humans is, it shows that as it summarizes down the bottom, and this is something that really surprises a lot of people in the United States, that we are so close together that if you were dying of some liver failure, and you wanted a, um, a transplant, and you were waiting for someone to be a good match for you to die in a car accident, you'd have just as much chance of getting a good match, if it wasn't your own family, you'd have just as much chance from someone of a different so-called race. Should we be surprised? No, because the Bible has always said that all men, all people, are of one blood because they descended from one man, because that's the true history of humanity. And in Creation Magazine, we showed this incredibly heartwarming story where these two people, obviously not the same ethnic group, best mates in the, that's, that's Australian for buddies, for our American friends, um, in the Vietnam War. The one on the right was dying of uh, kidney failure and the best match he could get was from his friend on the left and he survived and is doing very well. Thank you very much for your attention and I appreciate it.